move. And uh, this is our third cafe in this series of considering or navigating a move. Uh, we started out on the fifth as we uh, were talking about a variety of senior living options and virtual villages were one of those options. So today we'll dig really deep into what a virtual village is. Last week, we talked about all the stuff. If you're gonna move, you probably can't take everything with you because you're likely going somewhere smaller or you've had a big change in life and maybe uh, some closets, a garage, something like that needs a clean out or you're getting gonna bring a roommate in. What could we do with all the stuff? And in some ways we were liberated by learning all the opportunities. Some ways we were overwhelmed with it. But we also thought about how to make moments with the stuff a legacy moment to leave good memories in the hearts of and minds of those that uh, are we're close to at this time. So that was uh, that was what we did last week, and here we are. We're talking about who's in our village, what's in my community. So with that, I want to introduce you to our uh, speakers today. We've got uh, Denise Klein. She is from a virtual village called wider horizons and they are in the central Seattle area. We have got um, Emily Jones from Northeast Seattle together and they're called Nest. Uh, she's the, both of these ladies are executive directors of their virtual villages. We've got Don Dessonier. He is a member of the Nest virtual village. And we have Kate Burr, who is from Bellingham at Home up in Whatcom, and she goes to the Y with Tammy and uh, Mary. So it was fun to get connected with Kate through them. And we probably we we want to give you a good foundation on what a virtual village is with Denise, who will have a slideshow for us to just give you that idea of the fact that these are community building organizations and uh, they have been around for about 20 years and there are 280 separate ones in the country at this time. I'm going to leave it to our expert Denise, one of our experts today, to get us rolling with some some pictures and some info. So take it away, Denise. Okay. Open her slides up for us. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hmm, for some reason it's not active. I wonder why that um, would, oh, I put see. Put your mouse in it, you'll be able to change the okay. slides. Okay, yeah. Right. Good. So one of the chief um, reasons why somebody would think about joining a village is because they're feeling socially isolated. Lots of different reasons why you might feel that way. Retirement, death of a partner, Maybe you've made a move. People have joined our village after moving to Seattle because they didn't know anybody in Seattle. But there's lots of things. And then most recently, of course, we found out the pandemic. Some villages grew during the pandemic, such as our village, and others struggled to maintain membership um, at that time. But it was very important to the people who did belong to a village. Horrible things happen to you when you're socially isolated, for the most part. Um, and we're all familiar with those kinds of things. Hopefully most of us are not experiencing any of them at this point, because I suspect those of us who are in this gathering have pretty good social networks. Villages have a lot in common, even though we like to think that if you've seen one village, you've only seen one, most villages, the members of them do fun and interesting things together. They provide support either to each other or via volunteers who aren't members of the village or both. And then they develop acquaintances and sometimes even deep friendships. The uniqueness of villages is one of the things that I like about them. They reflect the DNA of the founders. And we're very fortunate today to have two founders from my village um, and at least one other founder in our midst. Boston was the first village. And actually I got some new statistics today that implied that more than 300 villages were open. So I'm not sure what's going on. There is a national um, village technical assistance agency to which most of us belong called the Village to Village Network. 
And those folks can provide just tons of useful information for those who want to start a village. They also offer an annual conference and a lot of other things, including a map where you can find out if there is a village anywhere in the United States, at least. These are um, three Washington villages, each of which is represented today. Bellingham at home, Nest, and ours. Um, Bellingham at home, is that right? 2014? Yeah. 85 members, largely volunteer based. And those are the dues. This gives you an idea of the range of dues and a little bit about the range of structures of villages, but not, not a lot of information. One of the ways villages differ is some have professional staff. Some of them have more than one staff person. And that's true today. We have, Nest has more than one staff person. We have one staff person. And although uh, the Bellingham Village uses professional staffing, I don't think they have any full-time staff. Right, we um, have one, one staff member at 20% uh, time. Okay, great, part-time person. Um, our village does not have an office. We are actually a virtual village in every sense of the word. Um, the office, you're looking at the office, which is my home office, also my living room. Mm -hmm. But Nest has an office, I know, and uh, the freestanding versus sponsor, I believe the Bellingham village has a sponsor. Would you, is that right, Kate? Yes, we're, we're a program of the Whatcom Council on Aging. Okay, great. And therefore you have an office too, right? Right, yes. Um, there are lots of different models about how services are provided. Sometimes, like in our case, we have very few volunteers who aren't our own members. And I tell a little story about the air conditioner, which was our first experience with somebody requesting services. Nest had told me that they had, in the beginning, recruited a zillion volunteers, but were short of members. So I tried to do the opposite. I just focused on recruiting members and figured we'd get the volunteers later. Because if you have volunteers waiting to serve people, you, you'll kind of lose them. So on, right after we opened, we didn't have any volunteers at all. And I got a call for service. One of our members needed an air conditioner installed. It was very hot weather. And I thought, hmm, air conditioner installation, what should I do? So I figured I could read instructions <clears throat> and I called another member of the village who I believed had a toolkit, even though he was blind and didn't drive, he had a toolkit and he was strong. This was a window air conditioner. I said to him, Joe, what are you doing right now? And he said, nothing. I said, well, I'd like to pick you up in 30 minutes and bring your toolkit because we're going to install an air conditioner. We went to the member's home and the three of us worked on installing the air conditioner. It took many hours. The most capable one of the team was the member who wanted the air conditioner installed. But both Joe and I supplied necessary attributes. And when we were done, after at least one whole day, we were all laughing and having a great time. And I thought, Hmm, this is an interesting way to do it. So we just kept on with that model and recruited a few volunteers who help with things like technology. Some villages emphasize services, some emphasize activities, and others emphasize community building through activities and services. And each of us, when we talk about our own village can indicate which ones we are. We're sort of the latter, community building through activities and services. Lots of different kinds of activities. We like to eat together a lot. And we've gone back to that just recently. We're, we're starting to gather in each other's homes again and in restaurants and outdoors to share food. We go to musical events, theater, movies, museums. I'm doing a museum field trip this Friday. And we have a lot of groups. Most villages have those same kinds of activities and groups. 
We also have lectures and workshops and publications. We, we have developed a number of publications for both our members and the rest of the aging network. This is a picture of Paul and Haiti. <clears throat> She's the person receiving services from Paul. Haiti is this lovely woman in the blue sweater. We can, we pretty much meet every service request. Sometimes I say we meet 99% of them, but really we meet more than that. I can't think of a service request we haven't met. And we do it in a variety of ways, including referrals to vetted services that our members have used or that I am aware of um, because I've worked in the aging network for a long time. We use many different methods of communication. <clears throat> I see that I stole some of these pictures because they still have the watermark on them. Um, but the most popular method other than face-to-face, -face, of course, when you can do it for our members is email. We do an awful lot of email. And of course, now Zoom. What does it take to start a village? Well, the most important thing it takes is what I call spark plugs, which is a handful of individuals who can commit a lot of time and energy and are very committed to the goal. And that's true of all the villages that I've had experience with. Then that small group grows to a bigger group. And by the time you get to 12 people, you can start to talk about, hey, we could become a village. And how do we get more members? And how do we set up our 501c3? How do we open a checking account? And all of those things that get you started. And you have to do a lot of thinking to figure out what model is going to work for you. So those are the kinds of issues that I've already covered that you'll need to reflect upon. Outreach to get members is probably the key one from my perspective. Um, and of course, some method of developing a revenue stream, particularly if you have, you've got to spend money on some things. You've got to spend money on insurance, for example, even if you don't have staff. So you have to have a revenue stream. I've listed all the villages that I'm aware of in Washington state that are currently open on this slide. And this shows them on a map, except of course the six that are in the Seattle area, you have to go to the map and click on it and you can't do it here. And that's the logo for the national technical assistance organization that we all belong to. So that's the slide presentation. Thank you, Denise. So just to you know, give a little further uh, basis to this is being part of one of these villages can, you can delay or maybe prevent people's needs to move into another level of care. Is that a correct assessment, friends? Um, that they could, you could be staying in your current home or you could have moved into a smaller place, but you're within the geographical area that a certain virtual village covers. And so that's, uh, you know, that is a requirement that you do live in the service area that that one covers. Um, but I, I, I remember, I think when Don and I were first talking, he said people could be living in an assisted care situation mm -hmm. and still want that social interaction through what the village provides. So. This is not that you're living physically with these other villagers, you're living in your own place, but you're in the geographical area that it serves. So I just wanted to give that foundation because I think that, that we didn't, we, I think those of us who've been talking virtual villages maybe jumped ahead on that little tip for everybody. So we actually have members who don't live in our target. Oh, okay. Um, See, they're target. all a little different. She's right. They're all different. And okay. That was an artifact of the pandemic. Oh, yeah. they wanted connection. Okay. Yeah, they wanted connection and they lived in, I don't think anybody who's a member lives out of state, mm -hmm. but they lived in other neighborhoods in Seattle or in one case in, um, on Vashon and um, we have a couple who lives in um, the Southwest part of the state, hmm. Great. Aberdeen. Oh, okay. Nice. Yay. All right. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh. So uh, yeah, Emily, I was going to ask if oh. you can kind of share some differences in Nest, the Northeast yeah. Seattle Together group, uh, as compared to what we've learned a little bit from Denise about the Wider Horizons group. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, we also have uh, members outside of our service area because we have different levels of membership. So we have um, an entry level for those that are craving just more of the social connection and the um, activities that we provide. And we call them builders. And there's no requirement that you live in our service area uh, to be a builder member. So we have some in Kenmore, around Lake Union, and in the Green Lake area. Um, you know, they're just looking for connections. Um, then we have our uh, full access membership level, which is 650 for an individual. And then on the slide that Denise shared uh, for an entire household, it's 975 for the full access. And um, what that, um, in addition to all of the other benefits that a builder member gets, they also have access to our extensive volunteer network. So we have a blend of member volunteers and non-member volunteers. Um, I looked it up today. We have 32% of our uh, volunteers are members. So we just have to have that, um, that mix because some, not all of our members are able to give back in the same capacity. So uh, for those like the um, air conditioner example, you know, um, our members range in age. We do have some in their late 30s and all the way up into their 90s. Uh, but oftentimes uh, the people that require the full access services aren't always able to give back in the same way. So that's why, as Denise mentioned, we do um, have a volunteer base of non-members as well. So um, should I answer that yeah, question? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. If you'd like um, to answer that question, yes. Yeah. Um, our member dues are annual. Uh, you can pay... Uh, all at once, or we also have monthly plans and we also do have scholarships, yes. Um, it is based on availability of funds, but we do our best to meet everybody um, uh, you know, that is interested in joining. The scholarships are for our full access memberships though. I've got it. So it looks like Denise and Kate, you were nodding that you had, these were annual dues in that listed in that chart. Okay, okay. good deal and the scholarships, okay. Um, Kate, would you like to talk a little bit about how the, the Bellingham at Home group is organized? I'll yes, I was just going one. to say, we, we don't go outside our area. Our area is Bellingham, but we, we started out trying to do the whole county. And then we realized that was just overreach for, for a group that was just getting started. So we've, we've offered to help other areas in the county to get started. So that's, that's another aspect of villages is that they can mentor each other if, if there's interest. Okay. So we have, um, we have at this point, we're up from 85. That was the number I gave Denise, but our, we're up to 90. We've actually, we've been growing quite a bit in, um, yeah. during the pandemic. Um, we of, of the 90 members, 30 are volunteers. And then we have another 42 non-member -vol non volunteers. And we do everything from activities, we do services, which was really the big, the big um, emphasis at the beginning was services. That's why people would, we thought that would get people to join. But really, I think what is, has turned out is it's the community building that is the big thing and the, and the friendships and, uh, you know, the connections that we make and the engagement of people. Um, people do call for services. We have one, we have an office that's staffed with all volunteers and people can call that one number to um, arrange for a ride to the doctor or arrange for somebody to pick up groceries for them or come and change a light bulb or something like that. Um, and let's see. Uh, our activities include a book group, a, um, a stronger memory group, we got the idea for that from the Village to Village Network um, meeting. And we have conversation groups called um, Gifts of Age and Speaking of Death, which are very popular. And then everybody in Bellingham at Home is also a member of the Bellingham Senior Center. And so we have all the activities that are associated with the Senior Center available to our members. A lot going on up in Bellingham. Good to yep. know about that, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I think I wanted to get us hear Don's story of how he got involved with his uh, group, Nest, the Nest Village. Great. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. So I'm Don Desonier, and um, 
back in 2015, I was living on Mercer Island. I'd lived there for 30 years and decided that I was going to sell my house and move to Seattle. It was real clear I was going to move to Seattle, but I wasn't sure where exactly. It so happens that I was also had just completed getting a certificate in gerontology from the University of Washington's continuing education program. And I remembered reading this little squib about in a category of this topic around getting older, older adults, options for where you can live and all those kinds of things that I um, came across virtual villages, just a little paragraph uh, on virtual villages. But what attracted me to that concept was the fact that um, as one gets older and you're thinking about uh, where you want to live and how you want, what kind of community you want to surround yourself with, um, a virtual village represented a unique opportunity to be able to be connected with an organization that supported older adults to be active, engaged, and independent. And that's kind of a core concept of pretty much all villages is that you're building a community of people that are looking out for each other and supporting each other and that the organization can support those members of that virtual village community. So I thought, I think that's what I'm gonna do. So I knew I was gonna to move to Seattle, but I didn't know where. I didn't know whether I was gonna to move to the north end, the south, I just didn't know where. But I narrowed my search down to two villages in their locations. One, the PNA village, which um, is the Finney Ridge Neighborhood Association um, in the Finney Ridge area, the PNA village, and Northeast Seattle together, or Ness, which is in Northeast Seattle, the Bryant, you know, near you village, Wedgwood, Ravenna, that area. And so my wonderful real estate agent, who well, was also my neighbor, helped me look by, she literally, we'd jump in her car and we'd be driving around Finney Ridge area and we'd be driving around Northeast Seattle. And um, ultimately I decided to live in Northeast Seattle. So, you know, within a couple of months of, of moving there, I showed up at the Nest offices with an appointment to learn more about it and signed some paperwork and, and joined as a Nest builder. And so that started my journey. That would have been uh, in 2016. In 2018, as I got more involved uh, with um, Nest, more just kind of being myself, um, I ended up joining the board in 2018. And then I was board president from 2008, from see, 2019 and 2020, I was board president. And then I left the board at the beginning of 2021 as another person took over because it was a two year commitment. And now I'm the member of the marketing committee, uh, subcommittee for Nest. And um, what's wonderful about you know, that approach, which is just, you know, me, Joe Blow, deciding to join um, a virtual village was that emphasis on engagement, interaction, uh, and as mentioned in Denise's um, great PowerPoint, this whole concept of isolation. Um, some of you may have heard that uh, the impact on an, an older adult, especially, of being socially isolated. And I'm not talking about being alone. A lot of us live alone. I do with my dog, but uh, and I don't feel lonely. I don't feel isolated, but isolation is you are secluded. You are not connecting with others. And it's the equivalent health-wise on smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So it's a real serious thing. So um, the, the opportunity for a virtual village to enhance the lives of everybody by both providing services, volunteers, and activities is a big thing. And uh, Nest, for example, uh, as alluded to, uh, has a lot of different activities. In fact, yesterday I attended a great presentation by a psych let's see, I'm going to get the initials right, psychiatric um, um, mental health nurse practitioner. Um, and uh, on sleep and what sleep's all about. And nobody fell asleep during the presentation, as I noticed. It was all very, very interesting. And there's all kinds of other examples of activities, book groups, support groups, men's and women's both, uh, pickleball. And you knew Emily wasn't gonna get that yeah. in there. 
uh, we have pickleball Fridays on Friday afternoons, we, uh, tons of activities. And as we've now moved to more in-person events, um, we now have, you know, I think basically all of them in person. And there are those that still prefer to participate by Zoom. Uh, as Denise alluded to, or no, or was it Kate about being out? Oh yeah, I think it was Denise, outside your quote unquote Casman area. Zoom's kind of opened up the door to that uh, by allowing people that might not ordinarily fit within that catchment area to participate and attend uh, events. So that's my little story. Um, and uh, I'm just uh, very blessed and excited about being associated with Nest and the whole virtual village movement in general. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks for your story, Don. And I'm looking at the chat with Bob's question about you know, how YMCAs might be able to spread the word about these villages and my wheels are turning. I'm part of the YMCA of Greater Seattle. So knowing that we've got two uh, of these villages in our service area, um, you know, my mind is opened up, but I, you know, I'm excited that, uh, you know, we've, we've got the Bellingham aspect of this and Methil Valley has a village um, over in the east part of the state. The farthest over I've seen is something around Yakima, Sela area. So you know, they are around um, and it sounds like people who are interested kind of get the ball rolling for themselves to create this for what they want to have in their community. And it is really, a, it's, it's your own grassroots activity, yet you have the support of this village to village network. So it's um, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. In fact, so I'll make a quick comment. Um, I attended uh, in the fall of 2019. It seems like yesteryear, given what 2020 brought us. Oh, sure. Uh, it was in Chicago, it was a village to village network conference. And it was wonderful to be able to sit in on presentations and at round table discussions from, uh, attended by people from all kinds of villages, from people that literally just, well, actually go backwards, people that weren't sure whether they were gonna do a village and they show up at this conference to find out what it's all about, all the way to fledgling operations. Uh, all the way to robust operations like the Beacon Hill Village in Boston, which is the inaugural village. So it really is fascinating to see how the villages have sprung up and, and grown. Wonderful. Yeah, I was wondering, Kate, you were talking a little bit about, I don't know, and I don't know if you felt like you covered this enough already, but just that recruiting piece and uh, how you're, you know, get the word out about your activities um, and potential membership. And then I did want you to, someone in the group to touch on communication. I love the idea that this is not high technology that keeps the group connected. So we'll go with Kate first. Um, and then how and anybody wants to pipe in on the group, how you keep the group connected. It was in the slides, but I wanted to emphasize this a little more. So go for it, Kate. Well, initially, uh, we did have meetings that were we advertised and said, yes, we're trying to get organized and come and find out more about what it's like to be in a village. But certainly in the last couple of years, there's been none of that. And yet people have know about it. We've been around long enough. We've been around since 20, well, we actually launched in 2016. And so the word has gotten out and um, people come and they just want to be part of, of a village that they, they know about those. So, and we get the word out um, with our newsletter. We have, uh, I do the publicity for the group. We have a newsletter. We have a weekly e-blast that goes to every, all the members and volunteers. And we, um, let me see, we also, since we're part of the Bellingham Senior Activity Center, we kind of piggyback on their publicity as well. Great. All right. Denise, can you talk? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, one of our key communication methods is a, month, a Monday morning memo, which tells what's happening this coming week. We haven't gone to, a, we have a calendar on our website, but we have some trouble getting people to use the website. Yes. So um, we have in the Monday morning memo, we talk about what's happening this week in the village. And also another section of it talks about what our members and friends have suggested we might do or read or watch. So those are links to interesting things. And that's very popular. Um, we have a newsletter that is more of a feature magazine in a way, quarterly. And then we have something that we started during the pandemic. So it's been going for more than two years. 
and that's a, a telephone tree. And it isn't the kind of telephone tree where each person calls somebody. It's a telephone tree where people who like to make phone calls are assigned a group of five people to call. And they do it, um, now we're down to once a month, but we were doing it every two weeks during the pandemic for quite some time. Then we have two all member gatherings each week on Zoom. Uh, one of them is every other week and one is every week. And one is in the evening and one is in the morning. So we pick up different people for those. And we mail the Monday memo to um, probably a hundred and some people, even though our probably 150 people get the Monday memo, but we only have 110 members. So some people who are thinking about joining maybe, or they just like to get a lot of news. And then we communicate with prospective members in a similar fashion, but we don't send them the Monday memo because they would pretty soon get too many things. Right. We also send out other announcements during the week of things that are happening. So you're not- There's a lot of communication. Is, yeah, this isn't Facebook. We're not on Instagram. We're not doing TikTok. This is really <laughs> foundational technology that the wider group is comfortable using and doesn't have to buy anything, get more apps. Emily, yeah, how do you want to- Oh, what's your just take in addition it? to all of the same yeah. um, outlets that they mentioned, you know, we have the weekly memo, the newsletter. Um, we also mail out our physical copies of our newsletters to those who aren't as tech savvy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so everyone still gets all of the same information if they're not comfortable with email. Uh, the one thing we are very lucky to have our neighborhood ambassadors, our neighborhood outreach, excuse me, we have member um, that they go around and it's a group of volunteers who are members who um, put up flyers for our various events and just make sure that we have pamphlets out there and, uh, oh, submit, uh, Oh, forgive me, articles to like community uh, newsletters oh, or speak at council meetings. So we definitely rely very heavily on that person to person connection within the different neighborhoods that we serve, just in terms of getting the word out there about us. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, we are very much the same with the other villages and that um, email is probably our primary communication, um, followed up by the phone. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I love hearing that one. So um, just a question, and we're loving you to put anything in the chat that you have a question about. We'll incorporate that into our time here together today. When people are considering joining a village, what are some of the common questions that you have all heard as you're, you know, explaining what your group does and, and helping them understand if they might feel like a good fit? What, what, what do people ask typically? What kinds of services do you offer? Okay. That's what they want to know. Okay. And that includes, of course, the uh, transportation service. That's the big one. But mm -hmm. also uh, small chores around the house and um, just also just checking in. I want to I have a phone call a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sense of connection. How do, I, how do I regularly know someone's looking out for me? Love right. to hear that. Any other ones? Heather, there's a question in the chat from um, Susan. She's asking Denise what's happening on the telephone tree. Is it just checking on people? Yep. And... Oh, I, I thought I responded to everyone. Yeah, I... it looks like you did. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. Thank That's you. That's okay. So, mm -hmm. so efficient, Denise. Thank you. So, yeah, she, connecting, seeing if a person is okay or needs something, and sometimes a question um, that gives the group some data so you can check on people that way. So, yeah. Um, asking about a fee, there is a, an annual fee for membership within these organizations. So that is um, a feature of that because now what does the fee cover? This is a good question. A new member would ask that. Okay. What does the fee cover generally, friends? Well, it depends. Okay. On, what? <laughs> it depends on whether you have paid staff or not. True. And you'll yeah. see a correlation. A village that has paid staff generally has annual dues that look like nests or wider horizons. Kind of in that 900 range look like. That's yeah. for a household. Oh, okay, okay. So one person uh, in one case would pay 600, in the other case 650, is that right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so um, to maintain, Nest has to maintain an office for which I think they pay rent. 
Yes, we are in a rare situation where um, while we are still a virtual village, uh, unfortunately, Northeast Seattle is one of the major areas in Seattle that does not have a senior center. And so the founders of Nest uh, felt that it was really important to have a home for Nest. So we rent space inside of a, a Wedgwood Presbyterian Church so that when we have um, like speaker series or lecture series, we have a place uh, for everyone to meet. And some of our interest groups meet here. Uh, many of them also meet in their own home. Well, now with COVID, that's changed. But prior to that, uh, sometimes they meet in coffee shops or in the library, that kind of thing. But we are unique in that we do provide um, an actual space for everyone because th there is no uh, senior center in our area. Looks like Emily's got her hand raised. Yeah. So I have a question and I, I'm sorry I came in a little late on the call, but because years ago I used to be an elected official, I always feel like I'm asking the question for the person that's not at the table. <laughs> and so the reason I asked about the fee is I, I have a mixed group of friends over the years, long-term friends. And it seems like a lot of these wonderful ideas to connect um, miss the people that have limited income. So I guess my question is, is it, it, can you run one of these on a sliding fee scale so that it doesn't disenfranchise um, a whole part of our neighborhoods that really need the help, but they just feel like they've dropped out of anything that, you know, requires fees and fees and fees. So, I mean, I guess that's my question is, if it doesn't fit for everybody, it seems like it just ends up being uh, useful to those that can afford it. And that's one of my criticisms is I just wonder, can you do it on a sliding fee scale? And it seems like it would be very easy to know what people's resources are if they would disclose them and then people would not be disenfranchised because of fees. Oh, Denise, yes, go ahead. So the problem for us, and I think I can speak for my colleagues here, is not that we can't offer a membership that anybody could afford. The problem is, how do you get the revenue that you need to run your village? And all of us have figured that out, I think. We, we have been able to offer to anyone pretty much um, through a variety of different methods. I think in the case of Nest, I know that they've used grants very effectively to support people who might not have otherwise been able to join. In our case, we're very successful at private fundraising. And we, we had some very big grants in the very beginning. So that got us started. But then we've been able to you know, fund ourselves with fundraising and membership dues. And we can pretty much accommodate people regardless of their income. Last year, I got a check for somebody who renewed their dues and sent me twice as much as she owed. So she sent $1,200 and she said, please use the other 600 to support somebody who would not otherwise be able to join. So I tucked that into the little pot where we then can draw funds, but we've never turned anybody away because they couldn't pay. Awesome. Yeah. I can say the same for us too, okay. that we have a scholarship program and we've re uh, previously received grants for that. And we've actually had uh, the option when people renew members is to donate to the scholarship program. But we've also had some wonderful members who have also just paid for other members as well. So it really is a community. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Bob has a question. And Bob, you're part of the Wider Horizons group. Is That's correct. I saw that in the chat. Yeah, not not a question. Maybe just a comment yeah, about sure. how, you know what do people ask uh, when they are considering joining a village? And <clears throat> I was involved in the early days with Denise, and um, I think what we found is that a lot of the people who express initial interest are not joiners by nature. They're not. They don't belong to a lot of clubs. They're maybe even a little skeptical about uh, you know what is this thing and what's the money all about and. So I think it, it often requires and, and involves um, continuous conversations with people to help them understand what the opportunities are. And um, ultimately, I think people come to the conclusion that they're building for their future. <clears throat> they're, they're, uh, and many people have networks. My wife and I joined, we had lots of friends and you know, different associations, but not quite like what a village offers, which is, a new set of friends who are committed to you in a way that 
you know, family, you don't want to rely on your family for everything. If you have family around, you don't want to rely on your old time friends. And so people see it as kind of an insurance policy as one of our early numbers thought about it. And when people start to understand that, the money is, you know, frankly, pretty inconsequential. I, I lived, I worked in senior living and yeah, you can spend $600 in a few hours uh, on services uh, if you don't have a network to support you like this one. Thank you for that perspective. Good yeah. Point. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah. We have a level of member called a supporting member, and that that membership is not does that member does not receive volunteer services. But if they should happen to need services during the year, say they needed a hip replacement or something like that, and they needed help for a while, they can get volunteer services for up to four weeks. Okay. And then they can change to a full member if they if they chose to. Nice. So, yeah, ways to kind of connect at a level that suits your needs for that time. So nice. Uh, let's see any inspiring stories. We'll probably have about five minutes together before we uh, close this topic out um, and move into some talk about our our community cafe app. But you know, I think we all love a story. And if we could end on something like that, if someone's got, I didn't prepare you, but I know, you know, a lot of people in these villages, there's got to be something that just reminds you of why you're involved with this group. So um, maybe Emily and Denise, a uh, couple, couple minutes for each, if you have a story. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, one of our founding members, her name is Donna, uh, died recently. And over the years, she was both a contributor and a person who needed services. Hmm. Um, she served on our board of directors, but she had some very extensive back surgery at one point. And that was when she began to see what Wider Horizons could do for her when she was laid up. And she got together with me and made a plan for what she needed before she went in for surgery. And then we delivered um, meals to her for quite some time after she got home which is one of the things we've been able to do, of course, and that's a fairly typical village thing. Then um, she never really fully recovered her mobility mm -hmm. after that surgery. And so we, we had a garden party at her house where we brought in, oh, 15 or more volunteers to clean up her garden because she was an avid master gardener, mm -hmm. but not able to do the work anymore herself. And one of our members who couldn't help with the gardening fix the food for all the other people. So that was a lovely event. Mm. Then Donna celebrated her 80th birthday party and invited, this was during the pandemic, she invited a few people to come to her driveway where she had set up, or her kids had set up a table to, and multiple tables and they served us cake and we sang happy birthday and we did that. And then not long ago, Donna discovered that she had um, a lung cancer that was going to um, eventually prove fatal. And we were able to help her find a caregiver who she could pay and provide, we also provided volunteer services, primarily friendly visiting. Mm -hmm. And the last thing we did, we, just in the nick of time, was we invited our members to write something about her and what she had meant to them. We put them on these beautiful, with beautiful type on heavy cardstock and brought them to her in a basket. And by that time she couldn't really read them, but we read them to her. And the look on her face was absolutely priceless. Mm -hmm. She realized how much we appreciated her. And very soon after that, she had a very peaceful death. So that was a great long village story. It was probably six and a half years. Um, for that. Yeah, Emily, what do you oh, have? In hopes that I would get to share something like that. I so I just joined Nest at the very end of November. So I haven't I haven't experienced too many um, you know, personal stories, but one of the things that I, I loved uh, learning about. So Nest's um anniversary or founding day is uh Valentine's Day, February mm -hmm. 14th. And I had found out that um in a support group that we have for people who have lost a long-term partner, uh, it's called On Your Own Again. Um, that there is a love connection and that there is now two people who are dating after being in that support group for a couple of years. I know, yeah. I love that. But then, um, so uh, 
<laughs> the week before I started Thanksgiving, or I'm sorry, Nest held a Thanksgiving dinner for people who might otherwise be celebrating Thanksgiving on their own. So um, we provided the food and and the location and um, very safely, you know, inside the church. And afterwards, we received the a lovely letter. Um, it, it's just a couple sentences I thought I would read if that's okay. Oh, yeah. From um, a member and a volunteer. Uh, she said, I have recently recommitted to volunteering after changes in my life that necessitated moving to an independent living situation. I am now settled in with time to volunteer. For me, it serves several purposes. When I lived in my home alone, having an issue without a solution was stressful to say the least. Even when I wasn't using the services, I always knew you would be there when I was in a pickle. I knew the issue would be resolved and resolved suitably when needed. Other reasons that I became a member and a volunteer include the chance I get to meet new folks, seeing the gratefulness in their eyes, the sincerity in their voices, and learning from them. Being a senior myself, I identify. Lastly, perhaps most important, volunteering gives me a purpose in life. All year long, it is appropriate, but being this is the season of giving, I would like to say thanks for an organization that provides kind, caring, and practical solutions to a myriad of issues. Nest is a senior's comfort food. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Super. Wow. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of you for just uh, the work that you're doing, your willingness to share. Obviously, this fills you, you know, this work fills you in more ways than, you know, the volunteer hours, you know, sense of satisfaction and accomplishment, but just, uh, you know, that the, the give and take in this community that you've created is, is filling you on many levels too. And that's really good to see. And what I loved was as you, people were, you know, the four of you were talking and I would look around in the zoom and people are nodding like, oh yeah, oh, that's great. And the nodding was my favorite, almost my favorite part of this activity, this time together too. So one quick question for in the chat, then we'll, we'll just give a nice big wave to our speakers. What's the average age? So that you've got the people who are volunteers, maybe just volunteers, maybe in their thirties to forties, fifties year old, average age of your members. And I may be wrong. I look like I'm wrong. Denise, I'll let you answer this and then we'll go to Nicole and that will be our time together. Go for it, Denise. Well, the average age of our members is 76. Okay, you got it. Is that similar for you, Emily? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay, yeah. great. Yes. Yep. Um, so any services in Pierce County, we did not see on the map, any virtual villages in Pierce Kitsap County area. So we may need to have a building activity happen there to get a village going. Need some spark plugs. We yeah. do. And we'll, like I said, we'll put the village to village uh, web link in our recap. So lots of research there. Um, and we've got these experts here too, that um, maybe can if you want more, re, uh, you know, your cafe team can get you connected to folks that can talk to you some more too. So let's give a round of applause to our virtual village people. Maybe we'll do virtual village, virtual village. <laughs> All right. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much everyone. I, that was inspiring. And uh, as a, I'm going to stop our recording.